everybody, back here in my own workshop. I'm Colwyn Way, um, here for the Skills Centre at Home uh, live videos. I'm sorry, we're a little bit late today. There are so many questions um, to go through that I've been spending all day prepping up uh, right up to the 11th hour. So um, there's quite a lot to get through. Charlie is always, as always, here. He's behind the camera. Um, he's going to be reading out questions as you have them. Um, but today's Q&A session um, is... Um, a mixture of all of your uh, all of your questions. So I've got two um, A4 pages here. We're going to start off um, where we left off on Tuesday. Actually, um, if you remember, I ran out of time. It's the longest video that we've done so far in this series. Went on for 57 minutes, and I like to keep it under the hour so we can get it on Instagram and things like that later on. So we finished um, fairly abruptly. So we're going to start on that now. If you remember on Tuesday, we um, had a, a shelf full of blanks there. Um, so I have been practicing um, since we've uh, last uh, seen each other and um, that's where we are so far. So um, a lot of them are finished. Um, the one that we are working on is this one. Okay, so we're gonna finish that one in a moment. Um, these are all finished. These three here, I'm just gonna show the camera. These are turned, but not sanded yet. And the reason being, um, I don't know whether you can see that. I might just come around to the camera a minute. Uh, the reason being, these particular pieces of timber, so this is a piece of U, um, these have got some quite big voids in. So I've got two U um, sh uh, grinders that have got these big voids. And I've got a piece of burr elm that's got some quite big um, areas in as well. So um, rather than uh, look at that as a flaw, we're going to turn it into a fe feature. And this is where um, epoxy resin is going to come in and, and really help embellish this piece. So this is supporting the timber. There's a, very much a debate on it is epoxy um, uh, or, or finishing stains, that sort of thing, colour. Does it hide the timber? Does it um, detract from the timber? In this case, it could be a problem having big voids like that. And I don't think many people would look at it as a feature. So I'm going to just um, fill it with um, epoxy and then return it later. So maybe in a later uh, video, we can show you the finished article. I'm going to get that done for this this weekend. Um, but just to, just to show you that I'm not just in the workshop on videos. I am making stuff all the time. I am foremost a maker. That is what I do. Um, uh, you're going to get a look around the workshop um, in this next hour. And you'll see some of the project that, projects that I've got going on. Not only that, I finished a load of jewellery last week after the jewellery um, session. I've got a, a mirror going on over there, a cabinet um, halfway being built. Lots of different things in the, in the middle of. And also preparation for you guys for next week as well. So let's get started. I've got a clipboard full of answers, uh, sorry, questions over there. We're going to go through, but we're going to start off with where we left last week. So if you remember, um, we had this U um, grinder. Um, that bit's turned uh, almost finished. Now what we had done to that one, we um, sealed with oil, haven't touched the inside yet. Now I've had a couple of questions. Let me just grab my clipboard just to ask this. The main question, and a really quite an important question, um, two people here, so I've got, um, uh, so Ken, he was asking, is you safe to use? And I had the same question from Alex. So um, surprised to be using you, I thought you was poisonous. Absolutely, you is a poisonous timber. Laburnum's a poisonous timber. I don't want to be taking any of the, the, the timber in. This is, this is a holder for peppercorns or salt granules. So before this is finished, this needs a swill through. If you're going to use finishing oil on the outside, a swill through with uh, finishing oil on the inside. Make sure it's sealed, it's dried, and all that dust has been taken off. Any loose debris is gone. So there can be no, um, no contamination to the, the, the peppercorns and things that are going through it. Remember the peppercorns are going through a grinder. So they're not wet, they're not um, damp in any way. So as long as that's the case, then absolutely fine. The places I wouldn't use you uh, are on things like salad bowls, things where you can have wet foods in, um, chopping boards, where potentially you're gonna have part of that timber um, sort of coming loose. So those are the no-nos, um, but this sort of thing, dry foods, as long as it seals, then that's fine. Now, sealing could be epoxy, so you could cover the inside with epoxy. It could be sanding sealer, all of those things, but just to make sure um, that there is no uh, loose debris going into the foodstuffs. So hopefully that's answered that one. Um, what we're gonna do, that's finished. Got to swirl that through yet, but 
Um, this is where we were left with. This is the part we were left with. So Charlie, as usual, come on over close. Let's have a look. We're also going to look through um, the parts that we used to put this piece together. So Charlie's going to come nice and close. I've got that hole in the middle. I've already test fitted it to make sure it actually fits together onto the bottom of the, the grinder. So we need to remove this area now. So we're going to put a little uh, drive dog and that was one of the questions that I was asked last week. What does the drive dog do? Literally that it's a drive. So it's, it's they're pieces of timber fit for the purpose that you're using them. So that's one drive dog. This was another drive dog that we used for the main body last week. But this one is going to do two things. This is going to drive, but then it's also going to support three of the tail stock as well. So just centering that up. There we are. A little bit of pressure from the tail stock. And it's a very fine taper that I've got there. Let's go for a smaller rest. Lay speed to zero before I turn the lathe on. So I, I don't know, we're gonna go with a skew. It seems the logical tool to part that off. Now I'm happy up to that wasted area there. So we can start parting that down. Until that just pops off, then the tilt stop can come back out of the way. We're just going to tidy up that last little area. Just bring the camera around a bit, Charlie. So the only thing that's holding that at the moment is friction. It's just on that little drive dog there. It's, it's a very fine taper. Um, so this one that I'm using at the moment, you can see the oil on it. That one's been used to do all of the um, grinders you saw earlier behind me. Um, now, once I've done that, we can sand. So just a quick sanding. Charlie, just the extractor on just for the moment, just very quickly and briefly. I'm going to start with a 150 grit. I don't need to go to the 100. This is um, chestnut finishing oil, this one. Um, if you remember what we were saying last week, uh, sorry, on Tuesday, you're gonna put this on, you're gonna leave it to dry 24 hours and then add another coat. So you'll, you'll have plenty of chance of coating the insides, deep dusting the inside and then buffing it off. I've had a question on buffing wheels as well. So after this, we're just gonna buff one of the ones that's dry, just to show you and well, gives us an excuse to get that one out, there we are. Okay, camera can go back now, Charlie. All right, back, back there just to see a, a slightly wider shot. Right, so that's all that was. It was just a little tape, a bit of scrap wood, that's a piece of lime, a little bit of scrap wood, a very gentle taper, um, and it just literally fits on. Um, whilst you're turning support from the tail stock, but that last little bit, you can take the tail stock away, nice delicate cut, and then sand and finish, and then it just pop off. So that one's done, that, will, that one can be added um, to the top, and we have our 
our finished or our fit and turned grinder we've still got to uh, put the thing together now we've already said I just want to clean that out so I'm not going to fit that one up let's do one of the others that I've already done okay so there's a walnut version of a similar similar sort of shape that one's ready to be fitted so to fit we're just going to use our mechanism so just come in a little bit closer to what's happening here Charlie so that's the mechanism mechanism itself that's how it goes together okay I'm going to use a couple of little jigs so this one's for the um, top there we are and we'll fit the bottom mechanism first so we pop that up that way that can sit on there because what we need to do is this is going to pop into there we need to tap that in if you remember we created a little recess in there for these lugs to sit in so that's going to fit in and then once I um, hit it down with a hammer that's going to clip in but the bottom the actual spur is going to come all the way through and I don't want to just put it on a flat surface otherwise it hit and I'll damage something so we need that little hole there so if I just hit the top of the mechanism I'm going to shatter the mechanism itself it's um, ceramic so that will shatter so what I've, I've done again it's just a little piece of timber um, this is going to sit around this area and that hollow's not going to touch the actual working uh, ceramic mechanism um, just pop that over the top and we're going to give it a couple of taps to, to get it started until he clips in and then that exposes that little area there. So that's clipped in now, so we've got the mechanism through. And then turn this piece over. Now all I've done here is a very fine little scoop out there and put a little bit of uh, router matting on the top basically. Um, that's gonna be our seat for the top. Watching your fingers now. Again, we're gonna do the same thing. Oops. They're under tension, so they take a little bit to start off. There we are. Same thing, I want it to go all the way down and clip in. That's it. Just to clip in, all right, and that's nice and neat, and also flush with the top. And then the only thing left to do is pop the whole thing together and fill it with your, fill it with your pepper or salt, whichever. All right, you can see the mechanism moving there. So a fairly quick and easy way of fitting those together. And I find crush grind uh, mechanisms one of the easiest to assemble. There's no screws or anything like that. Um, you saw the tools we used on Tuesday. And then just adding a couple of little jigs, or not even jigs, but just the assembly tools. Um, you can use those time and time again. Okay. So... We can put that to one side. That was Tuesday's job, done and dusted. Like I say, a few resin ones to come maybe later on in the next couple of weeks. Um, I'll always show you anything that we've started um, as we go through them. So someone asked about buffing wheels. And we have covered buffing wheels. So that person, let me find out who that was. And um, we used buffing wheels on, it's Steve. Um, a session on, yeah, various buffing wheels. So Steve asked, um, could I do a session on various buffing wheels? Steve, if you go to the fruit making section, check that, check that right out of the way. If you go to the fruit making live video that we've done, um, I think it was a couple of weeks ago now, we cover the buffing wheels. But we're gonna have a little look now as well, because um, I'm just gonna buff up one of these um, finished um, um, grinders just to show you where we, where we are with that. Now I've got um, a set of gripper jaws in there. To be honest, it doesn't matter what jaws I've got, because I'm gonna grip this um, parallel pigtail or parallel shanked pigtail uh, in the center. And that's gonna grip that nicely. And then for me, and this is how I've been brought up. So as an apprentice, we were using um, two stitched mops, but not together. One for dark um, timbers and one for paler timbers. For the paler timber, we use a substance called buff. Um, and that's uh, an abrasive compound. 
Okay, buff. That's the colour of buff, sort of camel colour. Um, that gets put on the paler, for the paler timbers. And then Tripoli or Tripomax, which is a darker brown um, chocolate coloured um, abrasive compound, that gets put on the, the, the dark polishing knob. Now that's the polish. For the glaze, we're using Carnauba wax. Now Carnauba wax or wood turner's stick, wood turner's stick, uh, this is Liberon one, but Chestnut do one, um, Hampshire Sheen do one, you can get pure Carnauba, you can go wood turner's sticks, which generally is a mixture between beeswax and Carnauba. They both give a really, really bright, vibrant finish. Um, if that's what you want, of course. So I'm not gonna have polishes on, I'm just gonna use the loose leaf which I would apply con oil wax with, just to buff one of these up. And let's go with, let's go with this nice one. This is a nice um, spalted beech one. So we'll take him apart, a little bit of speed. Usually I'm buffing it around between 12 and 1400 revs. It seems to work, um, that speed too, too slow, you're not getting as effective. A little bit of con oil wax, if you want, shiny finish. Remember, we're waxing over oil, but the oil's dry. If you try and wax over wet oil, you're not going to get the success. All right, and what this is doing also, the oil's designed to seal and raise grain. So as we take the grain away with the buffing, you get a really nice silky finish. Just that little flourish, that final little bit, just to make that, um, that grinder stick out a little bit more. Whenever you're using oil as a finish, don't use a sealer. You want that oil to penetrate into the grain, give that, give that tin back some life. There we are, again, put that together. All right, you can see the improved finish, the, the glaze on that. I'm not sure whether the shine's picking up on that, but a much improved finish. And that's generally the way on all of these sort of kitchen products, if I've oiled it, I'll just finish just by giving it a little bit more glaze. Of course, that glaze will not last. It's a kitchen product, we're using it all the time. Um, if you want something to last in terms of a finish, say for instance you're doing a light pull or something like that, or a bottle stopper, then you'll need to have a hard resistant surface there. So something like a lacquer, um, like a varnish type product, something that sets hard. Um, oils don't, they're a breathing, living um, uh, sort of finish. Um, so you, you will wear them at, at, after a while if they're continually handled. Think of all those acids in your, in your hand sort of thing. So I hope that's Hans answered that one. We will do a little bit more buffing because there's lots of projects that I use buffing wheels on. Um, but like I said, Steve, if you want to look a little bit more depth on that one, go to the fruit making section right at the end of that vid. Um, then you'll see a lot more um, to do with, with buffing. So let's just pop those just back out of the way for the minute. Start looking at a few more of these questions. So that was uh, a little bit about buffing there. So we've got a couple of questions here on, where are we? Um, tear out when you're using carbide tips. Um, on the inside of bowls mainly. Now carbide tips are very, have become very popular I would say in the past sort of 10 years, maybe 15 years. Um, the trouble is a carbide tip tool it is still scraping, so you're still using it as a, as a scraper. Handle high, scrape, and you get a lovely finish on things um, like end grain, very hard timbers, um, resins, all that sort of stuff. But you will emphasize the um, issue everybody has to uh, overcome on the inside of bowls. There's um, opposing uh, uh, sides. So let's grab a bowl. We've got a couple of rough turn pieces up here. I'll just take this down without everything collapsing on me. Um, so, come in a bit closer, Charlie, please. Um, so, I do. <laughs> so, um, end grain. So, the grain in this piece is running that way. So, you're going to have problems here and here. Everybody does. It's how we overcome those. Scrapers don't do it well. They will always rake more than a cutting tool. And when I say a cutting tool, I mean a bowl gouge on the inside of a bowl. 
your best bet would be to, to, to go to a bowl gouge and just do a finishing cut on the inside. Or a shear scrape. A shear scrape with a proper shear scraper. They're quite thick, they're quite chunky. Maybe a negative rake as well will also help. But if you're just doing a traditional scrape, handle high, flat down, you will have issues. The best thing, the best advice, if you're not going to use anything else, you're going to keep with it, then just take a very fine, resharpen, so turn the carbide bit around, a nice fine finishing cut, just tickle it, um, and you're doing less raking when you're doing that. Um, but it is a, it is an issue. You will get that, whether it's carbide tip or a uh, normal scrap, you are, you are going to get it. If you can get to a bowl gouge and cut the grain, will work better. Um, and when with a bowl gouge, put a, a secondary bevel on as well, take the heel away. So you're then presenting um, a convex curve to the bevel to your concave curve of your bowl. Just helps, helps hugely. So I hope that's that's answered that one. That, uh, just a finer, a finer cut really. Um, is the thing behind you a bandsaw jig for cutting log? It's on the floor. Oh yes. If someone's asking. Yes. We're gonna to come to that in a minute. Yes, absolutely. I've got a question here on jigs. So I've got all my jigs prepped up down there just to go over. So yeah, two seconds and we'll go over that one. I actually used that one um, when we were doing, I can't remember what we were doing now. We were doing leaning garlic pots, I believe. Um, and we were, cut, oh no, the um, palm pots. And we were cutting some log section up. So yes, it is, I'll, I'll show you in a second. Um, so uh, da, 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 we're one here, uh, um, I've got this AC240 lathe. Um, don't have funds for a chuck kit, what should I make? So the AC40 is a nice little bench top machine, um, fixed speed machine. Um, and that's a problem that a lot of people starting out have. You know, you've, you've spent all your, your pocket money, your, your savings on your first lathe. There's potentially a huge amount of other things to buy. You've got chucks, you've got um, turning tools, got timber of course if you're not fortunate to be able to get um, sort of wet timber there's maybe other machines a bounce or dust extractor is an absolute necessity when you buy a lathe PPE you've got to protect your face you've got to protect your, your lungs you know there's loads of stuff to think about um, but don't have funds for a chuck yet now I've answered this one on the last Q&A Q as well there's an awful lot of things you can do without a chuck I never had a chuck probably for the first year of my turning life um, as a as a pro ter professional turner, uh, professional turner, that's a horrible word. As a, a, a full time turner, that was my first chuck. Okay, that's what we used to have before these lovely chucks with um, uh, wood jaws on. We had this type of chuck. I bought this one from Axminster Tools around about 30, 30, 33 years ago, I think. Um, and that had those jaws and external versions of it and we just brazed on little little flat jaws to make it um, easier to use on timber. But if you don't have a chuck, then jam chucks, that's the thing. So we're going to break into another question while I'm asking, while, we're, while I'm answering this one. So jam chucks, again, we've used them, we've used them on the fruit making. So there's a jam chuck, that would be a, a, a chuck for making wooden apples and pears. That um, can be used on um, a faceplate, so you only have to um, use your imagination a little bit. Solid piece of timber, screw it onto your faceplate, and then hollow out. Keep a central hole all the way through, so you can use your knockout sticks. So there's the knockout stick. Okay, just a piece of beech dowel. That travels all the way up through the lathe, so you can actually knock your pieces of fruit out when you, once you've done one side and turn them over. But things like that, that really helps. Face plates, just use face plates a, a lot more. Um, think about turning with things like uh, glue chucks. There's nothing wrong with using a glue chuck. Sacrificial bit of timber, glue that to your blank, um, and then screw the sacrificial bit of timber to your face plate. Um, and then again, you're free to turn. Always use the tail stop. Make sure you're safe with that. Um, obviously, your PPE is, is, is paramount, but tail stop come up just to an extra little bit of support. But that glue chuck then just helps you on your last little cleaning up areas. Um, so that's a friction chuck, jam chuck. That's to be used um, with putting a piece of fruit inside. That's an opposite um, version again. You could use that on a faceplate. You don't need to hold it in the chuck. So faceplate there, and then that would be my way of reversing a, a hollow form pot or a bowl, something like that. So that the tail stock would push that onto the drive, and then you can turn the outside shape, 
Um, this will still be on your, um, your face plate, don't forget. Turn the outside shape, um, part off, um, so once parted off rather, um, that's your way of finishing uh, the outside. So you've got all of these sorts of things to, um, to play with. But spindle projects, you think about candlesticks, um, lamps are great one. Well, we're going to do a demonstration on using long hole boring kit soon. Um, that was a question by Godfrey. Hello, Godfrey. Um, he was asking, uh, a very good friend of mine, asking how um, we use long hole boring kits to make table lamps or even um, a two piece long lamp, you know. Um, so, we're going to look at doing some long hole boring in the next couple of weeks, probably not next week, but the week after. That's going to be one of the projects. Um, what what did you mean by the term raking? You said I was, I was... raking. So, literally that. So where where a cut, you're getting that nice clean finish. A rake. If you imagine, let's get that bit of stick back out again. If you imagine the fibres of the timber. So each my pencil, that bit of timber there, that there are two fibres. Imagine all those fibres are massed together. When you're cutting with a bowl gadget, you're slicing. When you're using a scraper, you're actually cutting the wood, scraping like this, and the, the timber comes down across that surface. So what happens is that there, an unsupported fibre just comes away. And so you get lots of that happening. That's what you're seeing in a tear. So you're getting lots of these tears. So those opposing faces of the inside of that bowl, that's what I call raking out. You get big fissures um, turn up, okay? So it's a tear, a rake. And uh, can you do some thread chasing at some point? Yes. We're going to do... There's. A, I've got another question here. Someone wants to see um, uh, how we do... Where, where is he? Someone wants to see um, how we do captive rings. Now, I, I don't really do that many captive rings. I'm be, be, going to be honest. I don't do much thread chasing. So I thought we could do a day where um, we do something that I'm not used to. So we'll just play. We'll, let, we'll see, see what messes I can get myself into. So we'll do some thread chasing. We'll do some captive rings. Um, again, won't do it next week because that's all set. Um, let's do it the, the week after. I'll get all the kit that I need to do and we'll do some threads and we'll do some captive rings. So at the moment, I can't answer your question, we'll discover it together, okay, a couple of weeks time. Um, so that's that one. Um, having problems with the skew. Again, look back through the archives. We've done a whole session on the skew, but let's just do a little bit more because skew is my favorite tool. Um, so we'll get a little piece of timber on the lathe a minute. It's been half an hour. Been half an hour. And this is going to neatly um, take us into another one of the questions um, that I've got on there. Um, we have a question here from Keith. Um, Keith is saying that he's got problems with the skew. He's turning an um, inch and a quarter square walnut, 20 inches long. Um, and getting some flex and also, um, so how do I overcome that? I'm getting another question here also from Graham. He's getting some spirals and some chatter when using the skew. So we're gonna make that happen. I've got a couple of pieces of timber prepped. Um, so let's get a thick piece in first, a nice chunky piece in. We're gonna look at what we call bevel bounce. Bevel bounce is one of those frustrating, annoying um, phenomena that happen when you're using the skew. Usually fairly on and early on in your skew life, um, but really frustrating. So that's a piece of softwood there, nice joinery grade softwood. There we are, and we can do a few questions here on this one because we not only have this one, uh, the one about the chatter from Graham. We also have the one about um, the 20 inch long from Keith. But there's also one someone has just bought. Uh, where are we? That's gone free. Someone has just bought uh, one of the uh, signature SKUs. And on buying it or on receiving it, has realized that the angle is slightly more acute than the ones I'm using. That's my standard skew. Charlie, is that in camera? That's my standard skew. Um, 
useful. This is one of my signature skews, the German profile signature skews. It's one of my original German skews. This one's from, from Urban Howe. Um, they're all about 25 degrees. Okay, so that's per side. So when I say 25 degrees, am I in shot there, Charlie? Hmm? Yeah, so 25 degrees, that's that angle there. Okay, so that would make the whole of that angle 50 degrees. So 25 degrees, that's what I'm aiming for. But, and here's the thing, most skews, especially oval skews, they come knife-like. Um, so it's up to you to sharpen them to suit you. Now, if you're struggling with a skew chisel, change that angle from knife-like and bring it more to, toward your 50, 55 degrees overall. That will really help you. You're not gonna get as good a finish, but for, for beginning, to, to get you going with the skew, to lessen the nerves with the skew, that will save a lot of catches. If you're still getting catches, put a secondary bevel on. Or if you don't want to change your angle, just put a secondary bevel on the first, you know, the first sort of millimeter. That will calm the skew chisel down, almost sort of neuters it for a little bit, I would say. Keeps it calm. Right, Charlie, we're gonna come around this side, mate. I wanna I wanna get the what's happening in my side. So as as someone would see if they're in their own workshop. And we're just gonna get a planing cut going to start with. So let's go with um, let's go with a nice. I'm go, going to go with a standard skew. Just, I suspect that's probably what you're more used to. Um, standard skew. So standard skews are uh, square on the face, square on the edge, and this is going to be nice and close in a minute, Charlie. Wonderful. Grand. So that section there we want to get. Tell me if this light's horrible. Uh, so we're going to start 45 degrees here. Okay, lift the bevel or rub the bevel, but lift the handle till the cutting edge makes contact there, and then you're good to go. Now it's a nice gentle cut, and the reason that I like using tapered skews more so is because they force me to hold the chisel nice and, and um, lightly. And I'm going to show you what happens in a minute when we press hard, and this is where your bevel bounce will occur. So roughing down, we can push forward. You can push back or pull back, sorry. This is just a roughing cut, remember? And then you can push forward. And that gives you a nice clean finish, ready to start shaping. Um, you know, so there's not that many tears or anything like that. Now, this is what happens, this is what a bevel bounce is. Now a bevel bounce is, you'll hear the bevel, you'll hear the bounce, but you'll also see it as a chatter, um, or in extreme cases, almost like a spiral running down the piece. Bevel bounce comes from pressing too hard on the timber. And if you think about timber as a, um, a ream of paper, so, or a book, the very edge of that book um, is hard because you've got the flat folds of it facing together. So that this area here, this would be nice and hard. The actual, um, the face of those pages isn't hard, that's quite soft. And so what's happening, the, the bevel is picking up on those soft and hard areas and it creates almost like an echo. So the further along that piece you go, the more echo you get. You get that on the outside of bowls as well, especially with a bowl gouge, because you're doing the same thing, pressing too hard, especially initially. So what you've got to do is just back off a little bit, take a lighter cut, Get rid of your white knuckles, just hold on to the chisel nice and gentle. Let it drift over all those high spots. And then eventually that bevel bounce will all disappear again. Now that, that is if, that is if that bevel bounce is down to you pressing too hard, of course. All right, so we're gonna do one other thing now. So that's a light touch will stop your bevel bounce on in that scenario. So one other thing, Charlie, just back a little bit. Let me change a few things over in the lathe. OK, 
Okay, so that is if you've got a thick, chunky piece of timber. So the other question was, I've got a piece of timber, it's 20, cent it's 20 inches long, it's an inch and a quarter thick. So inch and a quarter is about the size for smallish staircase spindles. Okay, so here's a piece of, this is actually a little bit harder than, than the um, walnut we were doing. I would go the other side again now, Charlie, and face me. Thank you, mate. So this is our, our what would be our 40 inch and a quarter, sorry. There we are. First thing I'm going to do with that, so let's say that's quite short really, you know, that's nowhere near staircase spindle um, length. First thing, and I'm not going to do it today because I need, need to clamp everything in place. At the moment, that would be far too short. If I'm doing things like staircase spindles, I've got a friend that's made me up a longer tool rest, but you can get extra banjos. There we are, that's my tool rest for longer, oh, that's my tool rest for longer pieces. Okay, that was what I would use. We're not gonna use that one because I need to clamp in place everything like that. And that's what I set for production work on, on longer um, uh, turnings like staircase spindles, which is quite a nice one. Um, first thing I would do on a piece like that is turn the lay speed up a little bit. I would very much encourage you to make yourself or by yourself, um, a steady. Steadies are really, really important if you're gonna do long pieces. This is way out of balance, okay? So it's gonna be going all over the place. Um, always start off with a, a roughing gouge, nice and gentle with your roughing gouge initially. I'm turning fairly quickly. All right. this I'm just testing by taking a light cut how flexible that piece is because different timbers are going to act differently even different pieces of the same um, species of timber will act differently so there I'm running at 1900 reps Now, if you're, say, for instance, you want to make a couple of staircase spindles, you need to you know, replicate something, don't be too proud. You're, you're alone in your own workshop. You don't have to use a skew every single time. In fact, a lot of the time, especially if you're in into speed turning, most people won't be, and I would certainly rule against it if you're not um, uh, you know, accomplished at turning. Uh, but a lot of people, if they are into speed turning, production turners, won't even go to a skew on something like this. They'll just go straight off the roughing gouge, they get a good finish with the roughing gouge, and then sand. Um, so don't be too proud to do that. There we are. We've still got a bit of a flat there. Um, only because the piece is off centre. It's been 40 minutes. It's been 40 minutes. Okay, well, we're going to carry on there. Now, I'm going to just um, turn the, the centre because that's going to be where you're going to get most spring. So, if you want to use the skew, you're going to need to support it in some way. That's why I was saying about using um, uh, a steady. The steady, and you go online, there's loads of examples of making steadies. Um, on things like Pinterest. Um, if you go to a fantastic turner, Richard Finley's uh, Instagram pages, have a look at some of his back catalogs of work. He shows you how to use and make steadies. I mean, there's so many great turners out there that you can get resources from that, that post for free. They give their um, time up for free. So look um, uh, and research. That's what I do. Pinterest is another good one. You know, you, you, you're looking at, at steadies that 
you can buy. You may not have a, be able to get one that suits your leg, so you might have to make some. Skateboards, um, uh, wheels uh, are utilised in, in homemade studies, or even um, just a push study. So where you're not using wheels, you're using um, a timber pushing against uh, what you're making, so it can't uh, rattle out of the way. Um, we've got those resources. Freehand, you're going to run into a few problems already. You can hear vibration. Okay, so we're getting that vibration right from the start. We're right in the middle. What I do, if I'm doing a couple of these, so without getting into the effort of making my steady, um, is use my hand as a steady. Now, to do that, you need to be accomplished with the skew chisel and be aware where everything is. I've got short sleeve smock on, so I've got nothing on my arms that's going to catch in the lathe. I'm aware of what's happening that end of the lathe, because I'm going to put my hand here and I'm not going to put my fingers anywhere near the tool rest at those pinpoints. Underneath, with my thumb just supporting the skew, and then I'm making a nice light cut, and there's my steady. But like I say, that's a practice, very much a practice cut. Don't grip the piece because you're burning fingers. My advice, my advice if you're doing a lot of these is to make yourself a steady. You're doing one or two, practice, practice, practice. Just using that hand, okay? Just using that hand, keep it out of the way. We know this is a pinch point and a dangerous part of the lathe, so just keep that, uh, keep your fingers well away from that. So I hope that's answered that one, that flat is still there. But you will get a fair finish from that um, if you use that method. Any more questions on there at the moment, Charlie? No. No, we're good. So we're rattling through these questions. Brilliant. Let's have a look. So um, I'm determined to get through all of these. So I'm thinking, uh, oh, I'm thinking of getting an eight by 10 workshop. Is that okay for a size? I don't have anything at the moment. Uh, last question from John. Absolutely. I started in my parents' backyard um, in a six by four shed. Um, and that done me for well, pretty much my first sort of three or four years as a hobby wood turner. Then when I started my apprenticeship, I got uh, exactly that size. I got an eight by 10 shed. And I, when I left my apprenticeship and became a full-time um, um, production turner, I worked in that shed. I was, it's just me, a Malay, my dust extractor and a bandsaw. Uh, all I needed really to keep me um, keep me churning stuff out. So yeah, absolutely. You, you can live to your means. That's all we can do. Um, just just turn stuff. Absolutely. Eight by ten is not a problem at all. Um, good luck with that, John. Um, maybe talk us through homemade. There we go. Some homemade jigs um, and the uses, please. That's from uh, Warren. Yes. So we've used a few there for the. Um, the uh, grinders so fitting them together um, I've showed you the uh, jam chucks that sort of stuff um, I've got a few more down here we're going to look at the cutting jig in a second but maybe not so much jigs but just useful bits of kit to make um, we've used a push plate we for the burr bowls um, that are doing really really well on the um, auction at the moment which we're going to talk about in a second um, but we've used the push plates from that this is a way of re reversing the the um uh, the bowls around to then take off the uh, the feet the underneath uh, or reshape we use that on the the resin bowls the palm bowls but a good push plate really useful bit of kit costs you nothing absolutely nothing um you can put that on your existing face plate or face plate ring um dead easy one and i'm using that all the time that's a bit of router matting just with um, contact adhesive so that's a good one i would encourage you to make one of those same sort of vein again sanding disc Okay, it's not going to cost you much. Maybe another face plate or face plate ring, bit of um, uh, scrap wood, um, MDF, uh, plywood, that sort of thing, and a bit of Velcro. Make your Velcro, um, sort of make your discs to the size of Velcro you can buy, um, rather than trying to source it the other way around. And just an, another little one there. So that's a fairly lumpy one. But if I'm going up overseas or anything, that's the same sort of. A little um, sanding disc that's made from a, one of the nylon chopping boards. So we had an old chopping board which is, which is not very, uh, didn't look very nice. So we cut it up, and I've made several of these. I just made that to sit in the drawers that I've got, 
Um, I've got a couple sets for different size jaws and just tapered the back, nice and light. A little bit of Velcro, and these use the power sanding pads. So again, nice, and easy, easy to access. And then if we're talking um, just useful things, so you can use your dividers to mark and, and um, to mark out planks for bowl blanks, that sort of stuff. Um, but what if, say for instance, you're cutting, seconds, you're cutting from a log. Okay, so a bit of timber like that. It's not always easy to see. If you have one of, uh, one of these sticks, you can position that over the log, scribe around it, um, and just to get centre a little bit easier. So just a series of those. This is a bit of Fomex. Fomex is a material that I use to make uh, moulds out of for resin casting. So just ever so easy to cut, either on the bands or with a pair of scissors, that sort of thing. Um, I've got a five, a seven, an eight, a six is about there as well. So really useful bits of kit. So if we we're talking jigs and useful homemade things, then there's a, there's a few to get you going. Okay, really, really useful. Um, okay, so that was Warren. So um, are we doing anything on sharpening? I've done a whole session on sharpening, Louise, um, but um, you're talking about without jigs. So again, that might be something that we can look at. There are, you can sharpen without jigs, absolutely. Um, as an apprentice, that's all, all we've done. Um, I'm just putting it down on my notes to do. Um, yes, we'll do that. I'll do it with a slow speed grinder. Pretty much um, things like Tormex Waterstone grinders, they have jigs with them anyway, so I would recommend just sticking with the jigs. We'll do it with a slow speed grinder. Um, next couple of weeks but yes absolutely um it's just breaking your movements down that's all you need to do break your, certainly in a bowl gouge um then you're breaking it down into three sections two wings and the center uh, spindle gouges aren't a problem because it's a roll uh, skew chisels um scrapes things like that we'll look at them all so yeah we'll do that especially for people that don't have jigs i would recommend you get jigs though because it's going to save you a huge amount of time um, and and worry and it's going to progress your um, your turning on much quicker if you don't have to worry about that side of it you know that the chisels are sharp you've taken that out the equation um, and you can deal with other problems when you know if you're learning um, to, to, to turn um, two of the, the jigs that I'm most keen on at the moment or at the moment that I've always been most keen on um, BGK uh, 400 so that is that's a setup from Tormek, which allows you to use their wood turning jigs on your bench grinder. A really good setup. It's, a, it's about 170 pounds, but you get everything a wood turner needs to sharpen on your bench grinder. Um, the other one is from uh, Woodcut, and it's the, the, the True Grind. True Grind has is, is been around for forever um, and work in the same principle as um, things like the, the, the Tormet jig, things like um, Wolverines, all of those are working the same sort of way. Two great jigs those if you're thinking of getting one. Um, go and look at the videos, we've done loads of videos on those so have a look at videos online. Um, but yes we will look at some hand sharpening as well, I get it and where that sort of links in really is what we were saying, you know, you bought, you bought your first lathe, what kit do I need sort of thing, it's, it's this expensive old process. Uh, to start with. Um, good lay for a complete beginner, what you can afford is the best thing. All lays do the same job, they rotate timber. Um, it was what you can afford. The most basic lay would be a bench top, um, non-variable speed machine. You will do a good selection of uh, things. Most most um, small lays you'll do a, an 8 to 10 inch bowl quite happily. But everything else, you can get chucks to them, no different than anything else. Pens, um, candlesticks, lamps, all those sorts of things. So I would go for what you can afford. And uh, I know from Axminster, um, it was the, um, well, I was looking at it earlier, the AC, the 240, just over the 200 pound mark, it gets you turning straight away. And then you can then, or your lathe will grow with you until you start to um, get, look to do bigger things. And that's when you trade and you go for something bigger, um, sell that lathe on and move, move up and sort of thing. But no, absolutely. What you can afford is the best bit of advice there. It's been 50 minutes. Has it been 50 minutes already? Um, oh, quick one. We're just, um, oh, right. So this is from Chris. Chris has been a massive supporter for all these videos. Thanks, Chris. Um, we're going to look at 
um, the uh, Excalibur uh, adjustable bits. Because you were asking a question, what um, cutters have we got at 42 mil um, that could do or hold tea light? So let's just have a quick look at that one. Then we're going to do one more um, question then from Lee, um, and then we're going to call that in because I've gone, otherwise I'll be going over time. So TCT cutters, um, we do a um, a force and long series 42 millimeter. Um, but if you didn't want to go for that one, then the adjustable one, I use the adjustable one. I do a lot of what we call um, Christmas pyramids, carousels, that sort of thing, the old German tradition. Um, and those are my um, tea light holders that I use to make these. I always tend to keep the piece long and drill lots of holes and then cut around the holes um, to uh, to do to make my piece. It's safer, you know, I want to have that clamped down. And if I've got a little tiny short piece, I, I'm difficulty um, holding it and I certainly don't want to be holding that freehand with that horrible thing whizzing around so here we go um, take your time I thought I could do this with a bit of softwood and it make it look lovely um, but no let's give it a proper test this is a piece of oak okay um, and I haven't sharpened this this has probably cut me I don't know about 400 holes I would have said by now so it's uh, it's due for a sharpen but uh, here goes so this is my and I'm not going to go all the way through because I haven't got a back in on the bottom, so I'm hands free, I've got him clamped down. Yeah, that's where we stop. I'm going to go right the way through the thing in a minute. Um, there we are, let me just show you that one. And that's for my 42 mil kind of hot. I need to go deeper, obviously, but that's that's set to 42. So I hope that's answered your question, Chris. All right, then one last question. So we're going to look. So this is from Lee. Um, so Lee's question was about the dust extractor. We've got we loads of questions about the dust extractor. It has done me really, really well, this extractor, I must admit. It's got a fine filter cartridge on. This is the 8060E. It's got a fine filter cartridge on, so that's down to one micron. Um, basically, what goes in doesn't come out um, for me. That's, that's the most important thing, because we've got a plastic bag on the bottom. Um, the 60 is the literage, so it's 8060E, that's 60 litres, basically. And um, the question from Lee was, so he's got a budget, um, the budget would get, um, he's looking to opt for the Trade 60E, which is this one, or go for the bigger, the 8070 e um, so 170 litres, bigger motor, two horsepower motor, that sort of thing, um, or look at the Kraft um, Cyclone. Now, there are, though the, the Cyclone AC118CE and the 170 are very similar in price. Um, but obviously one's rated at trade and one's um, a craft. If you're in business, um, Lee, I would absolutely go for the trade all day because that covers you, you know, it, it, craft is not set up for a, a five, six, seven day a week um, use. It's a hobby, it's a craft, you know? So I would, um, if it's just your hobby and you're, you're in the workshop three or four times a, a week, um, in the evenings, that sort of stuff, then they're all open to you. But I will say this, the bigger you go in terms of airflow um, will determine whether you can plumb that system in. I couldn't plumb that system in and have it running around my workshop to my bandsaw, to my plane of thickness, to my leg. It's simply not powerful enough. So what I do is I use it on each machine separately. Works perfectly for that. And at the moment, that's you know what I'm, what I'm dealing with. I am gonna set up, I've got a cyclone machine over there. There's a quick pan over there, Charlie. Just to quickly, um, I am going to eventually set that one up. To do that, I've got to extend my workshop. So that's in progress um, because I want to plumb the system in. That's what we're talking about. I don't want to be moving the thing around all the time. I want to have a system that I can just open blast gates and, and start. So I would say if you're looking to do something like that, um, go for the 170 or the, the Cyclone. If you're happy to do what I'm doing, go for the 60. That's the, that's the simple answer. Um, uh, and you're right, the, the, your selection is the right ones for what we're doing. We're looking at a good airspeed, a good airflow. If we want to pull from a plane of thicknesser, pull from a distance from the lathe, we need that type of extractor. Okay, um, Things like uh, vacuum extractors are great, 
but they need to be plugged in the stuff. I mean, they're not going to they're not going to pull from a very long distance away. Um, it's just it, great suction at the nozzle, but then it dissipates the further away you go. Okay, guys, I think that's it. I'm running um, quite a long uh, time now. We're getting a little bit uh, late in the day, so I'm going to. Um, just then, we're just reminding you um, about the auction that's happening um, uh, on eBay at the moment. So all of the stuff we've um, made in the first couple of weeks of these live videos, that's been auctioned. Today is the last day. The auction finishes at quarter past eight. It's appropriate that it's Thursday night. It's when we um, everybody goes out and claps to show our support for the NHS and all those uh, people working hard um, to look after us on the front line. So... Have a think about that. Um, I'm really blown away. We're up over £500 now. If we can get a little bit more out of you, then I will be really, really chuffed. It's a great way of giving money to wonderful um, NHS charities. So uh, once again, guys, until next week, until uh, Tuesday, four o'clock, same time, same place. Um, have a lovely weekend.